we taught a lesson called The Snare of the Devil based on 2 Timothy 2, verse 26, a verse that we had just recently covered in our verse by verse on Tuesdays. And uh, this week I'd like to continue the subject talking about the power of Satan. Last week I mentioned how that I had been captive to the devil, and so had you yeah. before you were saved. We all had been following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. And this week we're going to talk about the power that Satan has, lest we forget that he is not benign. He is not some entity that is just listless today. In fact, a minority of people even believe he exists, which falls right into his purpose. Yeah. Uh, people worship God ignorantly or don't know the true God. And so what they're inevitably doing is following a God of their own imagination or a God this world promotes, which is a false God. And so this is the snare and strategy of the devil. But when it comes to the power of Satan, we need to realize that he is not powerless. And this lesson is not at all to glorify Satan, of course. The word Satan means adversary of God. And we know the God that we serve is all-powerful and almighty. And yet Satan is also his longtime adversary. Uh, he is not eternal. He is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. And yet he has powers that he has used to influence and positions of authority that he has usurped over this world that we live in. So just as we all had been captured to the devil, we all now presently live under his dominion in this world uh, because it's the present evil world and he is the prince of power of the air. Uh, we are members of the body of Christ. We're ambassadors from a foreign territory Amen. in this present evil world. So we need to recognize what we're living in and what we're up against. In Genesis 1, verse 28, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and in six days He created all that therein was. And on the sixth day He created male and female. In verse 28 of chapter 1, He blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. You see the dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and every living thing given to man male and female created them, to have dominion over the earth. This would quickly come to a fall. In Genesis chapter 3 is the story of the fall of humanity. And the fall of man was a victory for Satan. It's not just something where, well, Adam fell, mistake, sin entered, death by sin, so I guess we're living in a, a place of our own making. And there's a truth to that. Uh, by one man sin entered and death by sin. All of sin uh, in Adam, and so death comes upon us all. R Romans chapter, five, or Colossians chapter 1 rather, Colossians 1 16, speaks about principalities and powers that are some visible and some invisible that were created in the beginning. And when power was given to man, to Adam, to mankind, to have dominion on the earth, and in a couple chapters of Genesis 3, he started obeying the devil. Romans 6 teaches us, Know you not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, him servants you are. All of mankind came under the service of the devil, whether willingly or not. So in Colossians 1.16, you see the verse here. By him, by Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things created by him and for him, one of those dominions was over the earth. He gave it to Adam. Adam gave it up, serving another god, the god of this world that he's now called, or the devil. It was a victory for Satan. Ephesians 6 verse 12 tells us that we do not battle flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The rulers in high places and invisible places, the spiritual places that operate and function in this universe that God created, are now captive by the devil, apparently. Powers of darkness. And so here you and I are wrestling, trying to make change in the world. God created the universe, is trying to change the universe. And that's because the universe has been corrupted. It's not true that the world we now live in is how God made it in the beginning or is even a product of God and his way of governance. That's not true. In the beginning, God created a world in which would reign righteousness and peace and joy where life would rule. Even man would live forever. 
when man sinned, which is not something God created, that was the disobedience to God, but obedience to the devil's lie, yeah. then what rules over man now is no longer life but death, not righteous but unrighteousness, no longer peace but misery and curse, and no longer joy, but again, misery. So this is a result of their obedience of the devil's lie and subjecting themselves to it. And this is the world that we live in now. Okay, a world that has continued for thousands of years under the authority of the usurper, Satan and the devil. Uh, it's, Christians like to talk about Christ being on the throne, and there is a teaching about Christ's resurrection and how Christ is the rightful ruler of this planet and will return, and yet that is not the case today. N neither has it ever been since the Garden of Eden that Christ sits reigning with authority on the earth if that were the case, he's not doing a very decent job. In fact, it looks just like how the devil operated. Okay, so you have an issue with that. But Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, talks about the devil and his power over death. And so it talks about Jesus being Jesus dying and his he died to, to destroy the power of death, the one who had the power of death, which is the devil. And so the devil had the power of death. Well, when did that happen? Like, did God create the devil and said, I'm giving you the power of death, like the Greek mythologies teach? No, that's not how it happened. The devil, who is just a name which means liar or slanderer, was not the devil in the beginning. In the beginning, Ezekiel 28 gives us some insight in that what we now know the being as the devil was an anointed cherub, a cherub, one of the defenders of God's glory, the anointed or covering cherub of God's glory, who fell in sin. The first sin in the universe was the devil. He was the father of sin. So every other sinner was a child of the devil, including man. God didn't make man sinners. They became that when they heard the devil's lie and followed that in Genesis chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, we go here for some definition of what children of the devil look like. Now, this is just academic here. What they look like. You were one, folks. Amen. And sometimes you still act like one. So you know by experience. But we're reading the scripture because the scripture holds a mirror up to you. You know, sometimes when you talk about what you are, you tend to lie about yourself. The Bible gives you the truth of the matter. So that's why it's helpful. 1 John 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. That's pretty clear. Is there anything that you can't understand about that verse? The only thing that would be a struggle for you to understand is that, well, wait a minute. I'm a sinner, and I'm in the body of Christ. He saved me from my sins, right? He made me a new creature. This verse has no room for that. That's because 1 John's not written to the body of Christ. Okay. But it is very clear in defining that he that commits sin is of the devil. It'd be a wrong application to say, well, therefore, Christians who are not of the devil do not sin. That is what is taught in some places, and that is entirely wrong. Okay, or, or Christians who get saved must stop sinning in order to maintain their salvation. This is also wrong, but this is all in light of the revelation of the mystery and the gospel of the grace of God. Without Paul's epistles, this is very legitimately said, because God's righteous standard for the earth and for everyone is that you do right, you're godly. You do wrong, what are you? Devilish. He that commits sin is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. You see that? He's the beginning of sin. Where did sin come from? The devil. The devil means liar and slander. He was one of God's greatest created beings, and then he sinned. We covered his purpose last week when he said he wanted to be like the Most High. He knew he can't destroy God. Satan's goal isn't to destroy God. It's to be like him. It's to be worshipped and praised, to be independent as he is, to be able to make choices, to, to have people make their own choices and have it called wisdom. That's what Paul will call the wisdom of the world, is that you can make your own choices without insight to God's truth and it still be wise. Well, the reality is, uh, without knowing the truth of God, your choices are unwise, right? And they're foolish. 1 John 3, verse 8, the, this purpose of, uh, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, if that's you, you got a problem, yeah. right? First John's not talking about you. He's talking about New Covenant Israel going to that kingdom, but his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 
In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So you, you see, God has children. The devil has children. So the Christian who says, oh, we're all God's children, what's their problem? They don't acknowledge Satan and his power. They don't acknowledge the father of lies, the one who begat sin. And those who are living in and walking in and are, are, are possessed by sin and its penalty and power are children of the devil. Okay? You need to be delivered from this problem. It's not just the sin problem. It's the one who has authority over it. Like Satan was the cause of this, you understand. He's the adversary. And so you have here children of the devil. 1 John 5 verse 19 says that the whole world is in wickedness. 1 John 5 19. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. Now you know you're of God maybe differently than how John knew. You know by the gospel of grace of God that you're a member of the body of Christ. But it says the whole world lies in wickedness. That's true today as well. We live in a present evil world, Galatians 1 verse 4. It should be no surprise to you then to say, well, I'm going to surround myself by good, upstanding Christians. Well, being good doesn't make you a Christian, you understand. So Christians have just as much problems with sin in them as other people, except they know what forgives their sin and know what saves them from sin, and they have been delivered from the power of sin. So they know how to respond to sin, but sin is in this world, folks, in and out of you. This world is wicked. This world is not one that is under the dominion of God at the moment. Right? His righteousness does not reign. His life does not reign in this earth. But that is what his kingdom is about. John 8, 44, Jesus said to the Pharisees, You are of your father the devil. He is the father of lies. Right? He's the beginning of it. It was the first lie told by the devil. And so dominion given to man to have righteous life and peace and joy on the earth was lost when they believed and thus put themselves under subjection to the devil in his lies, bringing sin, death into the world. He's the father of sin, the father of lies. He has the power of death. Okay. The devil, I already mentioned to you the name is defined as a slanderer or false accuser. Satan is another name given to him. Lucifer was the name in Isaiah spoken of uh, about him, him being a, a, a light bearer. We talked about that last week. But Satan means adversary. God has power. So does Satan. He's not powerless. He's not like God in his power, but he does have power. He does not deserve glory or worship, but we cannot underestimate him. If you are supposed to be ministering truth, that is a weapon of warfare in the spiritual battle of things. Truth. And you have to know what your enemy is and what he's capable of and what his power is, or else you'll stumble over the thing. You won't be a good soldier, as Paul describes in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You have to know what the truth is and know what you're fighting against. It's not against flesh and blood. It's yeah. spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, if I told you, and we were talking about spiritual warfare and spiritual politics, but you know, physical politics of this world, and I told you that you and I are fighting with information and policies and political decisions over the authorities in the highest places of our country. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? And also at the same time, it's intimidating. It's like, here we are, a small little group in the cornfield. How are we going to affect the highest positions of the land? Right? It's like, is that going to happen? We need a lot more help. You know, that's the idea. Ephesians chapter 6 says we're fighting something beyond just the physical positions that you see on the news that are in politics. It's beyond that. In fact, the politicians of this world, the, the positions in this world, all operate under the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. So we're finding something much higher than that. It's beyond that, it transcends it. It's deeper than that. Well, where do you get your help? How many uh, Bible-believing, mid-acts, Paulinus, how many people who know the truth of God and the gospel are there that you can rally around? Well, you say, well, at least people name the name of Christ. Seven out of ten Americans name the name of Christ, but they don't know what the Bible says. They don't believe the Bible. So you see a lot of armies that are powerless. The power of God, as we'll see a little bit later, comes from a not knowing of the truth, the gospel, the grace of God, and operating therein. But we can't deny or underestimate Satan's power. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, he's called the God of this world. Now, based on your 
inclination, the perspective on what God is doing today, some people say that verse, the second verse four verse four, is the true God. I can't I can't think of any other contradictory interpretation than that. Is that what is who which God is that? Second verse four verse four. One Christian says that's the devil, the other Christian says that's God. <laughs> that's a big difference in understanding. But second verse four verse three says if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And the God of this world has blinded the minds of them. You say, who would make that God? Calvinists. Because their God blinds people's minds, who he hasn't elected to be saved. All right? But there's some serious issues afoot here, doctrinally speaking, about knowing who God is and what is he doing in this world. The second is 4, verse 4, the God of this world is the devil. He's the one that blinds men's eyes to the gospel, the glorious, uh, uh, the glorious gospel of God, because of his lies, because he's a minister of righteousness, in 2 Corinthians 11. Okay? He's the God of this world through lies and deceit. In Revelation 12, verse 9, when he's finally put down, it says, the devil, or Satan, who deceiveth the whole world. It's not just that the devil deceives a small following of the church of Satan. If the battle is between the church of Satan, or Satanists, and Christians, Christians win, obviously. But that's not what Satan's doing. You know, the whole church of Satan thing, it, it's, it's just a ploy of provoca provocation against those who claim to know truth, you understand. And they're a whole message and communication. Half of them don't even believe what they're saying, which fits part and parcel with, their, with, with what they claim to, to, to hold to. But uh, most of them are just preaching a message of do what you want, which is not unique to the church of Satan. Okay, Wiccans teach that too, and humanists, and New Age, and a lot of Presbyterians and Baptists. So, like the, the lie that your truth can be true, even if it doesn't align with God's truth, is wrong. Amen. Right. But Revelation 12 verse 9 says, he deceives the whole world. And so before he put, gets put down, the whole world is deceived by Satan. And that's been true since Genesis 3, when the whole world was deceived by Satan. That being consisting of two people. Satan has a kingdom. Look at Luke chapter 4. People think of Satan like he's lurking in the shadows, waiting for his chance to pounce. He's got a kingdom. He doesn't need to do that. Like there's an operation. Luke 4 verse 5. The devil, this is the temptation of Jesus when he was incarnate and he was in the wilderness. The devil takes him up to a high mountain, shows unto him all the kings of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. That's interesting. Now, who gave the devil all this power? Not God. Like God didn't say, okay, I'm going to set a chess match here, and I'm going to give you this power. He didn't do that. He gave dominion to man. And what did the devil say? Man gave it to me. Did he? The devil lied, right? Deceived him. And through the power of sin, death, and deceit, he usurped power and authority. So now he can control the deceit. He, everyone's going to die because of sin and because of their following the lie that they don't need to pursue God. They don't need to know God. They don't need to be thankful to God. They don't need to, to, to know his truth. It's a lie, right? And that's how he operates. But he has a kingdom. Look at Matthew 12, verse 24. I'm hoping to impress upon you at this late date in history how... Satan's been operating for a while, and there's a system in place, a course in place, an operation in place, and it has ensnared everybody, and you are not a part of the majority trying to suppress a minority of satanic forces, but are actually the minority that has been delivered or rescued from this great power of darkness that reigns on the earth. That's where you live. And the great deception is you don't live in a place like that. The great deception is that's not, that doesn't describe reality, and that's believing the lie. That's not true. Matthew 12, verse 24, Jesus talks about the kingdom of the devil. <clears throat> when the Pharisees heard what he was doing, when, uh, verse 22, there was one possessed of a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. All the people were amazed and said, is this the son of David? Which was the proper response to this man doing miracles not because he was doing miracles, but because of who he said he was and why he was doing them. 
said, I'm the son of God, I'm bringing the kingdom, and here are miracles that the kingdom would bring with it. And so they asked, well, is he truly what he says he is? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. The famous Romai is now oft repeated, not giving God credit for it. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? Right? Jesus acknowledges the kingdom of Satan. No, he's not acknowledging him as an authority. You know, when he was tempted in the wilderness, Jesus could have responded, Satan, you don't have this power. But he didn't. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, because I'm going to follow the Lord. The, the condition of getting all that power and the temptation was to worship him. All you have to do is worship me. All you have to do is to say, you'll do what I, you'll, you'll, you, I deserve your praise. And I'll give you all the powers of this world. Right? And Jesus responded with, no, you, you serve the Lord thy God. It's the only one you serve. There's only one God. Right? And so that's the great lie. Even the outcome the devil promises is the same as the Lord's. Right? The difference is which one is true. Is the devil true or is God true? Well, that's kind of one side to call him the devil. He doesn't call himself that. You think the devil calls himself the devil? Like, that means liar. He calls himself the God of this world. He's, he's God. He's true. He's, he can be as powerful. You can be a God. There's no religion that teaches that, is there? Oh, right. Mormonism. Yeah. Right. Hinduism teaches that as well. Right. God is just a concept. He's an idea for the benefit of society. That's Buddhism. Right. Or a God of your own making. Baha'i faith, it's all sorts of gods they can worship. Respecting religious leaders of every religion. Well, that's a lie. That's a problem. <clears throat> but Jesus says, his kingdom cannot stand. Now, Jesus isn't here saying that, I always thought this was an interesting response, because Satan's devils and Satan himself does things in the world that, how do I say it? There are people who cast out devils not in Jesus' name. In Jesus' time, they were like that. So Jesus' point is, if you say, I'm doing it by the power of the devil, then Satan's kingdom won't stand. Because he's casting out himself. But if Satan's just putting on a ploy in a game, he can do whatever he wants. In fact, I might argue that what you see in supernatural powers in some places, the people claim is God's power is actually the devil's power. Which they respond with, well, if we're doing it by the devil's power, then Satan's kingdom cannot stand. That doesn't prove what you're doing is not of the devil. See, what Jesus said, it wasn't proved that what he was doing wasn't of the devil. What he's saying is that if you say what I'm doing is by the power of Satan, then you should let me keep doing because that means Satan's kingdom's not going to stand. He wasn't trying to defend himself. Like, oh, no, no, I'm not doing it from Satan. I'm doing it from God. He was saying that, well, if I'm casting that devil out, that person's healed. So you should like that even if I am doing it from the prince of the devil. Right? That's, that's what he was going on here. And then he goes on to talk about blasphemy, because they can't identify who God is. All right? But Satan has a kingdom. <clears throat> he is called the Lord of the Flies. You ever read that book? Lord of the Flies? A couple hundred books of the last century? Lord of the Flies. Okay? That is the English translation uh, of the name Beelzebub. Okay? Beel, Baal, Lord, Zebub. The Hebrew for flies. Lord of the flies. Say, why, why is it Lord of the flies? Well, it says back in verse 24, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, the lord of the flies. Prince of the devils. Devils fly around, as the society. They move about, they're in spirit, you know, that sort of thing. And he's the prince of the devils. That's why Ephesians 2 verse 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the lord of the flies. Right? See, there's God's throne in heaven, and then there's the earth, and there's everything in between, that ferment that separates everything, and that's what the devil does his magic, right? And so he's called Lord of the Flies, the prince of the power of the air. And look at Mark 4, verse 4. It's another example of this. Jesus is telling the parable of the sower here. And the sower is sowing the seed. You've heard the parable of the sower before. And there's different types of ground. Different things happen to the seed. In verse 4, it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, according to Genesis 128, who has power over the fowls of the air? Who's told to have dominion over them? Man was. Right? 
Well, then man gave up his power, did the devil. And then in Mark 4, verse 15, look what Jesus' explanation of this parable is. These are they which by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. What's the fowl of the heirs represent? Satan. That's interesting. So there's fowls of the air. They originally, man was given to have dominion over them. Man gave up dominion over them. And now Jesus tells a parable about the fowls of the air coming and taking the seed away. What's the seed? You know the explanation of the parable? Jesus gave it. The seed is the gospel of the kingdom. Is the truth of Jesus being the king and the kingdom come and the way in which you get in. And what happens with the fowls of the air? These are people to whom the seed was sown, but Satan comes and takes it. What's it say? Take it the way the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, if that does not give you a little scare, I don't know what does. Satan taking the word of God out of your heart? Like, how does that even happen? It doesn't tell us how that happens. Sowing seed and Satan gets in the way? I mean, it's one thing to think, well, we're sowing the seed and some people believe and some people don't. That's the natural course of things. People make a choice. People believe or they're not. They hear the word or they don't. But to think that there's some other entity, like the devil coming, is going to take the thing away? Like, hey, here's the seed and that bird's going to get it. And suddenly Satan comes and takes it away. It's like, whoa. You ever seen something like that before? Yeah, I've never seen the devil. Like, what are you talking about? You ever seen something where you try to lay down some truth and suddenly here comes someone else trying to help, but they're, they don't understand what they're doing? They're ignorant of truth. They say something that's wrong. Right? You know, the gospel is Jesus Christ died for your sins. It's not what you do. It's what he did. And here comes the Christian brother. But you've got to make sure you do good works after you're saved. What are you doing, devil? Right? This happens all the time. Now, I just told you the gospel of the grace of God in Mark 4. He's talking about the gospel of the kingdom, different gospels here. But I'm talking about Satan's operation, the way he can do things. What power does he have? Apparently, he has the power to take the word of God out of people's hearts. The words go into the air, into your ears. And the devil's influence and power can deceive people into discarding it. Right? think about that a little bit later as we talk about the power of God. You need to make sure you keep yourself from the devil. Don't give him place. Amen. Okay. Paul gives you that instruction. He's the Lord of the flies, the prince of the power of the air. Satan has a kingdom. He has devils. He has fallen angels at his command. And he has the men of this world, the course of this world that he's set, that people follow, which is a lie. He can influence your heart. Look at John 13, verse 2. Now, again, we're talking about what the devil is doing here in a dispensation that is not yours. So keep that in mind. We're just gathering some verses here of what his capability is. Do you think the devil follows the dispensations of God? Somewhat of a trick question there. He definitely understands them. But do you think he like does whatever God says to do? Well, no. But he knows what God is doing. The devil knows his opposition and he operates accordingly. So you need to know both God's will and how dev the devil is going to react against it. And the good news is the Bible tells us about these things. A lot of Christians don't want to talk about the devil. It gets too mystical, cartoonish even. You know, it, it makes you sound maybe even charismatic. What was just to be casting out devils to people? In the name of Jesus Christ, come out! You know, what do you do? Right? How do you combat such a thing? I mean, are you even equipped? You can, you can fight physical enemies. I mean, fisticuffs, right? I mean, you know how to do that. Maybe some weapons, a club or something. You can do that. Right? Build a house of protection, a gate, a fence, a border. Something. You know how to combat physical enemies. But when you can't see it, or beyond that, if the enemy is mental, how do you deal with this? The world's solution is drugs. Good luck with that. Right? We're going to alter your mind because that's where the battle's at. <laughs> well, that's going to help. With that type of chemical imbalance. But John, John 13, verse 2 Here's at the supper that they were having before Jesus' death. And Judas was there. Judas, he says, I've chosen you, and one of you is a devil. Remember that? Well, Judas was the devil, obviously. Not the devil, singular, but he was the one among them that was a liar. That's why he called him that. That's what the devil means. And Judas, it says elsewhere that he was a thief. So Jesus chose disciples. Judas was among them to choose from. And he apparently had a pretense. Like this idea that there are Christians in churches that have a pretense about who they really are and what they really think, it's not new, folks. It's like 
Jesus even knew his mind. He knew his mind and said, and you, as he was going to betray him. He knew that. It wasn't a surprise that he was betrayed. John 13, verse 2, the supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot. Now, now here, it's not Jesus calling Judas a devil. It's the devil put into the heart of Judas Iscariot. How did that happen exactly? Here's Judas minding his own business, and suddenly the devil comes. I mean, how does that work? If I put it this way and said, did God put something in your heart? This is Christian language, isn't it? Like, what, what, does, what does that mean? You say, well, not, God doesn't do that. Well, he does it. Doesn't he change hearts? How does he do it? How does God change heart? How does God put things in your heart? Through his words. What you hear, what you believe, right? How, how would the devil do it? Same way. See, that's how you change people's hearts. So again, this is not like the Calvinists would say, we talked about last week before, where they think God changes hearts by reaching in and regenerating someone before they even hear anything. That's, that's not how John 6 is speaking about. The word of God is what is communicated to someone, and that's what can open their minds and their hearts when they believe. And the same with the devil. If you're believing some lie, you can put it in your heart. I'm sure that in John 13, verse 2, Judas had some wrong ideas before this verse. Yeah. Okay. In John 13, down in verse 27, later on, after the sop, the King James is so hard to understand. What in the world is a sop? After the sop. Well, you have supper, right? <laughs> and what do you do at supper? You eat sop. <laughs> That's what it is. Anyway, after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. You know, when Jesus told Judas to do what you intend to do, right? This thou doest, do quickly. It, it wasn't just Jesus talking to Judas. It says Satan entered into him. That's different than he put it on his heart. He put it on his heart was the first step for Satan to be able to use Judas. Just like the Holy Ghost can't empower someone who doesn't first believe. Right? Satan can't enter into someone who doesn't first not believe in Christ. That doesn't first believe in the lie. Satan enters into him, and Jesus knows this and says, do it. Because now is the time. That was the time. Right? Jesus knew what was happening. He knew when it was going to happen. In Acts 5, verse 3, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, looks at Ananias and says, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, knew what Satan was doing. That's a God-given power right there. Okay, but it was Satan that filled their heart to lie. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2.18. Satan can hinder things. 1 Thessalonians 2.18. When you know who Satan is, and you know what his agenda is, you can see his influence. And that's how Paul can say things like this. It's not just Paul saying, well, something happened I didn't like. That was the devil. That's not the criteria that you don't like, it doesn't meet your plans, or it frustrates you. You have to know what God's will is. You have to know what the devil's will is, what his agenda is. And when you see his influence and agenda being played out, just like when you see God's will and influence played out properly, you can discern. Light from dark, God from the devil. You can do that. If you don't know God's will, you're definitely not going to know the devil's will. Right? So it's just like you couldn't say, well, God did that. And if you don't know God's will, you can never say God did that because you don't know what God's doing. Christians, that's, it still amazes me how they can do that. It's amazing only because I now know the will of God from Scripture. But I once was like that too. Claiming God was doing things, and I had no idea. Yeah. You'd ask me if God did that. I said, yeah, he did that. He did that for this reason. And then you'd ask me, secondly, what's God's will? I said, I don't know. I'm still looking for that. Well, how do you even know what he's doing if you don't know his will? If you know God's will in the scripture, you can know what the devil's doing in the scripture, and you can discern who's doing what. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse, verse 18, <clears throat> Paul says, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but... Israel hindered me. My kinsmen hindered me. Pilate hindered me. The Romans hindered me. No, he says, Satan hindered us. What? Paul, you seen Satan? I saw him walking down the road the other day. 
No, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, I visibly saw him. He knows what God's will is. He knows people who are against him and are doing the will of the devil. And so he's saying Satan hindered us. It's not like Satan individually was right next to Paul, even though he could have been. It's that his agenda was being played out. Right? Yeah. Do you know what Satan's will is? So that when you see it done, you go, well, there's Satan working work. Because it happens. When people don't know the truth and they're not doing the will of God, they're at the very least following their flesh, and at the worst, which is most common in the case, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, or otherwise known as the will of the devil. Well, that would, Justin, that means that a lot of people are doing the devil's will, and sometimes you maybe have done it exactly right. Now you're getting a picture. The devil is not some third party over there that is only second to your own power. He has more power than you, that's what I'm trying to say. He knows more than you. He's been operating longer than you. And you, knowing it or not, are affected by what he's been doing, which is why you need to be equipped with the knowledge, furnished with the knowledge of God's truth to know what God is really doing. To know how to defend, so you have a defense against these powers. You can be delivered from these powers. And when you see opposition, you'll know whether it's God or not. When people simply judge by the circumstances based upon their own preference and, and predilections. They they tend to spin things for their own benefit. Yeah. Well, if something's against what I wanted to done, then that's the devil. Well, God's also against you and your will. He wants you to be sur subject to his will. Amen. How do you know it was the devil? I had a big old plan and purpose for my life, and God, of course, wants me to do that. Well, how do you know that? God has his own purpose he wants you to do. And I was almost there. I almost attained my dreams. And I was stopped by this one thing that had to be the devil. What if it was God saying, I don't want you to fall on your own will? You see, it's not about you. <laughs> you are the pawn in the game of the great universal adversarial conflict between God and the devil. Or truth and lies, righteousness and unrighteousness, Peace and misery. This is the universal battle. It's the curse on all creation when sin and death entered into corruption of this world, and God's trying to solve it through the interjection of truth. You see, God could just snap his fingers and get rid of all the evil. He could do it. What's the problem? You exist in this evil, and he wants to save you from it. So he has to filter out. There's evil, and there's, there's that guy right there. I need him saved. This world's a mess. He should just end it. But then he couldn't save any of you. So he has to come down into this filth and mess to actually do the means to save you. See, that's, that's the great conflict we're in. And when he's done in his long suffering and saving men, he will come back and obliterate, exterminate, distinguish, and destroy the devil and all his power. And all those who are saved will be saved from that. And if you're not, you're part and parcel with them, children of the devil. Right? You're going with them. You see, the great operation of God is to steal. I shouldn't say steal. It's deliver. It's salvation. It's rescue. Because they're not devils to begin with. To deliver people from the power of the devil. Return them back into God's intent, which was in the image of God. Right? He's subverting the devil. That's what's going on. The great glory in that is that the means through which he's doing it is something that the devil himself helped put in place. And that's just like God, to use his enemies for his own ends. Right? Meanwhile, moving on here, uh, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. <clears throat> we have Paul talking about the end of things and talking about the Lord's return, who shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. This is the destruction of Satan. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Notice here, even though Paul's not making this as the main point, he says indirectly that Satan has power to do miracles. Right? Signs and lying wonders. Signs of what, I wonder? Early or in the chapter, this man, this man of sin, was, was going to be revealed the son of perdition, declaring himself to be God. Well, how would you do that without first evidence, right? When Jesus came declaring himself to be God, what did he give? Miraculous evidence. And that's what this man's going to do as well, perform miracles. 
You have to be aware of that because Jesus performed miracles, proved he was the Son of God according to prophecy. This man of sin, otherwise known as the Antichrist, the great wicked one filled with the devil, is going to be to reveal the Son of Perdition when he declares himself to be God, the very same thing Jesus will do and has done, performing miracles. Right? So how do you know if a miracle, I mean miracles, what kind of miracles are they? It's supposed to be miraculous deaths, right? People just dying for no reason. It's the, that, that, that's not something anyone would say, oh yeah, it means you're the Son of God. No, it's going to be the miraculous powers that are lying. They're going to believe them because they provide great benefit. Among them is healing. Read Revelation. The devil can heal. And who doesn't want a healing? Everybody wants a healing. So how do you know if the power, the supernatural, real power that saved your physical body and healed you was the devil or God? How do you know? That's a good question, isn't it? The battle isn't just over, can you be supernaturally healed? The Bible has instances of that all throughout. The question is, why were you and who did it? Right? Jesus came and healed lots of people. The question should have been, why did you heal me, and who are you? Like, why, what's happening? Right? So you didn't have control over that, did you? Well, I'm talking to you as if you were one healed. But in Matthew, Luke, and John, people were healed. What was supposed to accompany that was, you're the Son of God, which was true. Right? What if someone's healed, like in Revelation, someone raises from the dead, and is the devil doing it? Everyone in the world says, in their ignorance and following the lie in the course of this world, that's the Son of God, and it's the devil. That's a problem. So we have here Satan performing lying wonders and signs of his own divinity, though he's not. That's why they're lying. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus says the thief comes to steal and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the thief does. Steal, kill, and destroy. He says in John 10 later, my sheep hear my voice, right? And so you need to know who the shepherd is. But there's going to be one who says he's the shepherd, and he's just coming to steal. And you caught me in an error earlier. I talked about God stealing. Like, God's not the one stealing. The devil is the one that's stealing. Yeah. God made people. He usurped authority. And so mankind was God's. The devil stole it. And Jesus is coming as a shepherd to deliver his, the, the sheep of Israel. And the thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. Now, that's not his banner. That's not his campaign slogan. Vote for me, stealing, killing, destroying. So his campaign slogan is, vote for me, get things. Everything that you need will be paid for. Where do you get it? Don't ask those foolish questions. You'll get what you need. Comes to steal, they'll come to kill. I don't know how many times the last month now, since Roe v. Wade's been overturned, I've heard the, the weird response that we need to save lives by creating laws pro-abortion. We need to save lives by allowing abortion. It's like, it's such a lie. Yeah. Like, abortion kills. Not, not abortion. You know, and yet that's the idea. They're trying to kill us. That's why they don't want us to have abortions. I haven't heard such a blatant lie, like actually endorsed by people, than something like that. To destroy this world is filled with ladders for you to climb and things for you to do which will dissolve in the dirt. Right? That's what it is. It's not that he comes saying, I'm going to knock down what you have. If anything he's going to knock down, it's the tradition of following truth. That's what we find in our country. The things that get knocked down the quickest are religious institutions, specifically those that have to do with Bible-believing Christianity. When the world starts laughing at something about the Bible and Christianity, you should pay attention. Because that might be something that should not be torn down. And when the world builds something, you should also pay attention to what's behind the curtain, because that thing probably won't stand very long. And everyone there spending their time and effort and money trying to build something is probably going to fall flat on its face. That's the destruction. Right? The world thinks it's so intelligent and progressive and powerful and yet it will come to naught, the Bible says. So thus the teaching of something that's eternal, right? Satan has power over the course of the world. Look at Job 1. Job did not have a Bible. Okay? 
Job did not know what you now know. Job asked God that he would write something down so I would know what you're doing. If there's anyone in the Bible that has that legitimate cry, it'd be Job. Yeah. You don't. You have a Bible. God told you what he's doing. Job didn't. And things were happening to Job. He's going, what in the world? In fact, God himself says things were happening to Job without a cause. Like things were being taken away from him and he didn't do anything wrong to deserve it. I mean, he was a man like the rest of us. There's nothing righteous, but he was upright, God said. And things were happening he didn't deserve. And Job wasn't privy to this information. He's like, well, God, tell me what's happening here. <clears throat> Eventually, God addresses him. But we're talking about Satan this morning and his power. Look at Job 1, verse 12. The Lord said unto Satan, this is God saying to the devil, Behold, all that Job hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth in presence of the Lord. What's Satan's power in Job 1, 12? Apparently, everything that Job has, right? Now, I'm not here saying that God's given the same authority over you or not, but would it be a surprise if you had your possessions taken away or destroyed or lost, if the devil has the power over such things? It wouldn't be. You see how this can affect your thinking? Like, if you serve God and you serve him trying to be a minister of, of truth, truth in his word that you can read right here, ministering God does not accompany you having all possessions in this world and you lose possessions or possessions fail or the vanity of this world just happens to you, why would you think that it's God prohibiting you or something? It's the course of this world, folks. Now move on here. This is an example. In Job 1 verse 13, there was a day after Satan went forth having power over Job's possessions. There went forth a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger into Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now consider the situation. I'm sure it was a coincidence. Right after God said, all he has is in your power. It was a coincidence that the Sabians the next day came and took away his, his people and killed his servants. I don't think so. Like, the context it doesn't indicate this. Like, so who did this? The Sabians? Satan did it. Now, the Sabians were the tools, right? But Satan did this, didn't he? Isn't that true? Satan did this. His servants killed because of Satan and the power he had over the things that Job had. Right? Who allowed that guy to live? God did. He, he, God saved me alive. In this case, Satan did. To tell Job. Why? To rub in the misery. I mean, that's obviously what he's doing. Right? In the context, because you, you can see behind the spiritual veil here, right? Job 1, verse 16. While he was yet speaking. So this is not like five weeks later. Another time in life. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven. Now that's interesting, because who did that? This must be the true God retaliating, right? No, that's Satan. But the servant thought it was God. The fire of God came down from heaven. Um, have you read the book of Job? I mean, no, they didn't have it, you know. It was Satan doing this. And it burned up the sheep. Lightning strikes your house. The other day was a storm knocked on three branches from my tree. You might as well look up to heaven and say, God must have done this. My trees needed to trim anyway. Thank you, God. If you don't, if that's not God's will, you can't say it. This book tells me what God's doing, rightly divided. And if that's not God's will, I'm not going to say God did it. Because even if it wasn't God, you know what? There's other entities out there that can do things. I'm not going to say they're doing it either. All I know is that Satan runs the course of this world, and things happen. And I will not let them deter me from doing the will of God. Right? That's your response to circumstances. I'm not going out there telling you to claim every evil thing that happens against you is the devil. But rather to understand, we live in a world where things like that happen. Satan has the power to do such things. And what you should know is what God's will is. And nothing can hinder you from that. Amen. Job didn't know God's will, but he was still walking upright. These guys thought God was doing this, and he wasn't. They were wrong. And hath burned up the sheep and the servants and the consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So people are dying. At whose hand? Satan's. Verse 17, while I was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands. Chaldeans, plural. There's a gang here. And fell upon the camels and carried them away. Again, slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped to tell thee. What a coincidence. 
This is Satan. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. It's like a tornado, right? Wind. Who's controlling this one? Satan. All I'm trying to point out here is not that every tornado is Satan's work, but rather Satan has the capability to do such things. Okay? That's not the end of it. Because even after all this, this wasn't the issue with Job. In verse 22, in all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. The servant of God said, the fire of God destroyed your things, Job. And Job said, eh, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not going to charge God foolishly. That's what Christians do. They charge God foolishly. Chapter 2, the devil says, this isn't enough. I need more power. And down in verse 6, the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand. Not just his possessions, but he is. But save his life. So went Satan forth and smote Job with sore boils. Who made Job sick? Right? Satan. Who could remove his sickness? Satan. Whenever he wanted, he could be like, well, I made him sick, I can move it. Like, what kind of supernatural... I don't even know how that works. I mean, boils come for medical reasons, right? There's like scientific things that apparently there are spiritual entities. God himself, among other beings, have control over physical properties that can make such things happen, like wind storms and lightning and sicknesses, right? Our world is not just material. It's time to say, no, this is not true. We've studied things out. We know exactly why things happen, except for those rare occurrences we can't explain. I see. So... You don't know everything. You just know what you see happen consistently. Okay. Because there is cause and effect. There is people getting sick for physical reasons. And, but there's also, apparently, God can do things and Satan can do things. and There's other things in this world. It's all about trying to get people to believe the truth or a lie, depending on who you're talking about. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul said a, uh, a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him. as to be exalted above all. All things, right? Satan has an opposition to God's will. And so the course of this world means that your ministry is going to be in the face of resistance. Right? And uh, when God, in the beginning, sanctified a woman's seed in Genesis 3.15, instead of the seed of the woman, right? You'll, he'll bruise his head. Satan tries to corrupt it in Genesis 6. You have the corruption of men's seed and people becoming corrupt. There's a child of God. There's the children of the devil. God forms a nation. What's Satan do? Using nations to corrupt it. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, Samuel's lamenting because Israel wants a king and God told them they didn't need a king, but they wanted one anyway to be like the other nations. Like, why do you follow that lie? Why do you need to be like the other nations? That's the devil's life. That's the devil's work. Making these nation, other nations. You think the devil had nothing to do with other nations becoming powerful to influence Israel to be like them? Israel had their own power. God parted the waters. Like he brought them into the promised land. They th think they can have it. And yet they didn't trust those things. By the way, they knew that's what God was doing because he told them that's what he was doing and then he made it happen. That's one way you can know that God's behind something when he first tells you and then he does what he says. And it's according to the word of God, how they divide it. God sends prophets. In 1 Kings 18, 21 and 22, Elijah's there and he says, I'm the prophet of God. Right? And Satan has his own prophets. There are 450 prophets of Baals there. Although well, those people are false prophets. Well, what does that mean that you're a false prophet? Does that mean that you can't actually know the future? Or that you just tell the future wrongly? Or you tell the future in a way that makes people believe that God is wrong? All of the above. You see? God sends angels. Daniel chapter 10. Look at Daniel 10 verse 4. God sends an angel here to, to Daniel to answer his prayers, right? To give him a vision. And then the angel, it's a fascinating dialogue here, says something to Daniel. I mean, God's angels are just sitting in a row, right? They're up there, and, and God says, go, and they go, and that's it. This is how God works, like a heavenly hospital or something. I, I'm being facetious. That's not how it is. Daniel 10, verse 4, 
In the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lift up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz, whose body was like beryl, his face as the appearance of lightning. This is an angel. Every angel in the Bible is a man. No angel in the Bible has wings. This is an angel. Angels don't have wings in the Bible. There are other beings that have wings, not angels. All angels look like men. That's why they're not given in marriage. Because a man and a man can't make a marriage, according to the Scripture. That's how that works. But anyway, in verse 5, it describes his, his, his appearance. Verse 6, his appearance there like lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of the words like the voice of a multitude. Drop down to verse 12. He said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. The first day, I, the first time you prayed, God said, Go. And I went, and I am come for thy words. Verse 13, But, but, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. For three weeks, the prince of Persia withstood me. Like, come on, angel. You're an angel. You know how strong angels are? Well, if you read the scripture, they got more power than man as far as physical power, right? And he's withheld for 21 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, the chief, the chief angels, came to help me and to remain there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people. Finally. You can hear the angel's desperation, right? Daniel, sorry I'm late. Three weeks ago, I came, really, I came Prince of Persia held me up. Michael had, I mean, Mike, you know Michael. Michael had to come to help me, and now I'm here. I'm here now to tell you the message. Right? It's like, just tell me the message, buddy. I don't need to hear your travel story, you know? But you learn some information about the opposition, the resistance of this angel coming to Daniel. God sends angels. Satan has devils doing his work, too, you know? Okay, so just as there are strong spiritual beings, that's why the warfare is not on this earth, folks. Humans are so puny. God ordained authorities, and men sit in them. And if you could see, which we can't, but if you could see the angelic spiritual world, it'd be like, people are not what's stopping anybody, God or the devil, from doing anything. They're the conflict. You are the prize. Yeah. Right? You are what they're fighting over, but they're fighting, you see. He's, God's made you soldiers. The devil has his own foot soldiers. Right? He doesn't care if people are sacrificed. Christ sacrificed, God sacrifices his son to save you. God puts on humanity. In John 1.14, he puts on flesh. God himself puts on humanity. That's a good idea. I think I'll do that too. The devil puts on humanity. He enters Judas in Luke 22. And in Revelation, the wicked one comes and inhabits the Antichrist. Okay. John 10, 12, Jesus warns of sheep, a uh, wolf in sheep's clothing. And then later he says, you're my sheep. The sheep hear my voice. You know why the wolf in sheep clothing gets the sheep? Because they're in sheep's clothing and they're walking with the sheep. When they make themselves look different, then the sheep get scared. <laughs> well, how do you know the wolf from the sheep? Thank God you're not sheep. That's Israel. But you know the difference because one's lying, right? Looks just like a sheep. What's going out of his mouth? I'm going this way, you know. It's a lie. The Lord in Revelation 5, verse 5, is called the line of the tribe of Judah, which, of course, is a prophecy back to Genesis. 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter says Satan is roaming as a roaring lion, roaming about, a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion today. If Satan was a roaring lion today, it would seem odd to fit in to what God's doing and yet captivate people with his lies, he needs to be a minister of righteousness. Because that's what God's doing. Communicating his righteousness through ministers and through the church. And so God himself, or, or, or the devil himself rather, captivates people with a lie of being a minister of righteousness. And then another lie is compounded on that saying, our differences don't matter. That is a devilish lie. Amen. Right? You believe that thing, I believe this thing, at least we're all in the church. 
You know, the church is defined and described by the doctrines that we believe. What we believe matters greatly. That's how you discern the devil from God. That's how you know God's work from the devil's work. And to say what you believe doesn't matter is the devil's lie. And yet, this is repeated ad nauseum by Christians and churches. Doctrine divides. We're supposed to love one another. Yes, God's words are we're supposed to love one another. That is true. And it is also true that doctrine divides. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't stand for doctrine. True, sound doctrine. Because right. if you do that, however, you're going to start eliminating wrong teachings and devilish lies. In the time of the Lord's return, when Christ returns in power, there will be an antichrist in power. Okay. When God reveals his wisdom, Ephesians 3, verse 9, Satan claims to operate by the wisdom of the world. Right? Those people believe in old book, they're not really wise. Follow me and my wisdom. Right? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2 through 4, he hides the gospel through the so-called luxury and beauty of the wisdom of this world, which is constantly proven wrong. If you keep a track record of the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of God, God wins hands down, but no one has the, has the perseverance to keep it such a track record. They think it's just something preachers say. Okay. Evolutionists now are questioning evolution. Just like they've questioned other things. You heard of Thomas Malthus? Thomas Malthus was an economist in England 200 years ago who thought there was no way the world's population could get to the, where it is today. And the reason why he said that is because we don't have enough land to grow enough corn to feed enough people. Okay. It's, all, it's science. It's the dismal science. We don't have, we just do the calculations. I've done the calculations, he says. We cannot fit. People are going to start dying a generation or two. And whoops, he was wrong. He was wrong for various reasons that other economists discovered, right? But he was wrong is the point. You know how many times the wisdom of this world has been proven wrong? And how many times the wisdom of God has been proven correct? If you're just keeping the track, like I said, it'd be hands down, but nobody does. Because they're constantly bombarded with, that's a foolish old book. It's, a foolish, it's not true. Those people aren't educated. They're not experts. Right? That's the lie. Our job is to spread sound doctrine, Ephesians 3, verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Is there any surprise? People ask, well, why doesn't anybody see it? Well, we're in a dark world with ministers that call themselves righteous that are actually preaching darkness. Right? There's a course the world that's already been set. So when you're born into this world, just operate according to the stream of the world. You're going to go against God. Right? And in churches where the devil operates primarily, trying to deceive people with lies about religiosity, they're communicating that differences in the Bible don't matter, and differences in Christians don't matter, and doctrine divides. And so is it any surprise that it's a struggle to try to shine truth onto people? Right? The good news is, is that people still get saved and still get delivered. Because God's power does that. Our job is to spread sound doctrine. God is not the author of confusion. Right? That does not mean when you open your Bible and you're confused that God didn't write the Bible. That means you're not God. So that's the proper logic. Right? But Satan does cause confusion. That is the point of telling a lie. The first question the devil asked Eve was, Yea, hath God said? The first question he asked Jesus when, in his temptation was, If thou be the Son of God. That's always, if that Bible is true, if that Bible is really true and perfect like you say it is, that, that's language of the devil. Right? That doesn't strengthen faith that ministers doubt and confusion. The power of God is found in truth. Look at Mark 8.33. We talked about Satan's power, and you say, well, this could be a dire situation we're all living in here. Except that God has intervened to reveal his word, intervened to reveal his son, intervened to reveal the mystery of Christ, so that we can know his manifold wisdom, that we can come to a knowledge of the truth, and other people can too. Mark 8, 33. This is Mark's account of when Peter denies what Jesus said when he said, I have to, I have to die in three days, rise again. Peter didn't know that that was actually a gospel, going to be a gospel eventually. He said, um, not so, Lord. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Verse 33, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, get thee behind me, Satan. You know that part. Mark adds something here in explanation. Why did he call Peter Satan? 
Satan means adversary, right? And Peter was saying something contrary to what Jesus just said, I am going to do. When God or the Son of God says, I will do this, you don't say, nope. Because that, that's like going against his will. He says, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. All he did was resist what Jesus said, but Jesus is God. Right? He did not savor the things that be of God, the things that be of men. He didn't understand what Jesus was saying. He didn't like what he was saying. That doesn't mean you don't say, okay, you said it. I guess this will happen. The power of God is found in the truth. In Acts 13, 10, the first miracle Paul performs in Acts 13, <clears throat> at least as recorded in Acts, is he goes to a Jew and blinds him. And look at this description. Acts 13, verse 8, or 7 and 8. He's going to Paphos to minister. There was a sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was the deputy of the county, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. He called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. This guy wanted to hear what they were preaching. But the sorcerer, his name was Elymas, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the truth. This wasn't just someone ignorant, someone just foolish. He was withstanding Paul. Now, who was Paul? the apostle of God's grace, a dispenser, the servant of the Lord, preaching the word of God to see this guy saved, and this guy is withstanding him. Whose will is this guy doing? The devil's will. Okay? And it says in verse 9, Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? That is what the devil's doing. And Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, identified that and said, that's what you are. Just like Jesus did to Peter, right? And you see it happening too. When people in the name of Christ resist what God's doing, what is that? We're not battling flesh and blood, remember? We're not wrestling flesh and blood. It's spiritual wickedness. It's rulers of darkness. It, that has captivated people's minds. Okay? The power of God is in the gospel of Christ. Romans 1 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the power of God, which is the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 18, to those, those of us who are saved, it is the power of God, the preaching of the cross. The, the reality is the cross is good news, Amen. not bad news. We glory in the cross. We don't weep over it. Right? It's a subtle difference, but one's of God and one's of the devil. Okay. Death and sin are defeated by his grace at the cross. Romans 5, verse 21, grace reigns today through the death of Jesus Christ, giving life to all. Romans 6, verse 9, sin has no more dominion over you. Death has no more dominion over you. Guess what was the power struggle with the devil? He had the power of death, the power of sin. That's what his hold was over this world. When Christ, through his death, delivers you from the power of sin and death, and you and him, okay, take part in his death and resurrection, then you can be delivered from the power of the devil. Christ delivers us from, Colossians 1.13 says, the power of darkness and translates us into the kingdom of his dear son. So you were held captive to the power of Satan. And you had no way to get out of it. You may not even have known it. Maybe you didn't know it, still didn't know how to get out of it. But Christ is the solution to that. In Acts 26.18, Paul says he's going to Gentiles to deliver them from the power of Satan. To deliver them from darkness to light. They may receive forgiveness of sins. In Ephesians 4, 27, we're instructed not to give place to the devil. We'll kind of skip right over that verse in Ephesians 4. Speak the truth in love. Then he says, don't give place to the devil. What, what was that? Keep moving on, you know. Oh, yeah, we love Ephesians 4, 32. As Christ hath forgiven you, we forgive other people, right? Don't give place to the devil. He just kind of snuck that one right in there. What does that even mean? We're speaking the truth. We're building a body. We know the truth of what Christ forgives us, how that comes by. The devil is all these lies that are coming to tell you these are all wrong. Now, we're just trying to persuade people of speaking truth, but it's devilish lies that people are captivated by. Yeah. Don't give place to the devil. The devil can influence your heart. Lies and deceptions, wrong truths, corrupted doctrine can influence how you think about God and what he's doing and his ministry. How then do you do that? How do you not give place to the devil? Well, where the devil wants to have place, maybe put in that place the truth of God. Hmm? Philippians 4, verse 7. 
Keep your minds and hearts through Christ Jesus, not through your own effort or your own wisdom or the wisdom of this world. Psychiatry is a damnable practice. Yes. Okay. There's been books written about that, not just by fundamentalists. There's a problem with it, spiritually speaking. It does not understand the things of which it speaks about. And then it tries to cure people with tools that still can't address the problem. And it does all this in the name of replacing the Bible and God's means of helping people spiritually grow. Like what else do you call that? It's not physical intervention that they're doing, even though that's their tool to solve a problem. Look at the DSM, you know, it's like you, you read this thing and the conditions, they, they just, they put them in there. They invent them and they put them in there. They don't have to have the scientific study to find a molecule that causes this thing. They just, they just revealed the other day, after more studies, that they said depression is not linked to a lack of serotonin. Whoops. Like, you know how many drugs were given to people to increase serotonin creation, to fight depression? And how many problems were caused by those very drugs in the name of solving your depression? Whoops. Actually, there wasn't really a solid link between those two things. What's well, chemical imbalances? I'm sure that causes problems. Yeah, it's, it's medicinal. It's, mechan it's physical. There's spiritual issues too, you know. There's spiritual concerns that people have. There's spiritual problems that people have that God has sent the gospel of Christ to solve. Right? Where you can have righteousness and peace and joy and love and long-suffering and temperance and, and all these things by God's word working effectually in you. And anything contrary to that is a lie. Okay. Eventually, Satan's power will be shut down, and nothing will be in existence on this world but truth. Won't that be a day? Amen. In the universe, Revelation 12, verse 9, it says, The devil, Satan, the great dragon, called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which, is accused, uh, which accused them before our God day and night. Here we're talking about the coming of the kingdom of Israel on this earth. This happens in heaven, too. Right? He's kicked out of everywhere. No more. He, his power is taken away. The power that he usurped wrongly. In Revelation 20, he's bound for a thousand years, and he's actually released after the thousand years. He does the same thing he's doing now. Because that's all he can do. He's the father of lies. And it says in verse 8, He's, when the thousand years are, are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to what? What's he going to do? Deceive the nations. So where truth is going to be operating from the top down on this planet, he's released and suddenly deception starts creeping in. Yep. Right? There's going to be ever an experience to show people that this guy is the cause of all the problems. It's, that, that's going to be it. Yeah. A thousand year kingdom. Okay? Peace reigns. He's saying, well, that's because humanity reached its pinnacle. Let's release the devil, see what happens. Men start being deceived. Many get destroyed because of that. Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast to the lake of fire and brimstone. That's, that's it for him. And thank God for that. Our opposition is not flesh and blood. It's the devil and his lies. That's the real enemy. When we fight amongst ourselves as ourselves, we're not recognizing the, the real problem, which is people's belief of the truth or of a lie. Your weapons of warfare are speaking truth, understanding truth, rightly dividing the truth. It's this book, rightly divided. And you can open people's minds to understand what truth is. And you can protect them, you can defend them, you can deliver them from the power of darkness and the devil. And bring them to light. You can, you can see clearly. Right? And so, it's important, hopefully that was helpful, to understand Satan's power and stronghold over this world. And how God has given the right tool for us to combat that. Amen. Any questions, any comments? Yes.